So the next thing that we're going to look at is defining the data. There's still a, a staggering amount of data that's required for a study. Some of the data is actually for the short circuit analysis. Some of the data is for the coordination study, but you still need to perform all these different types of analysis. So there's, there's a lot that goes into this. As far as the data itself, you begin with determining a lot of protective device data, utility data, transformer data, rotating machinery data that can contribute to short circuit currents. There is just an, a, an incredible amount of data that goes into conducting these studies. Many years ago, with the uh, ArcFlash Forum, I mentioned I, I have the ArcFlash Forum site. Many years ago at the ArcFlash Forum, one of my questions of the week that I asked, this was probably around 2009 or 2010, so it was quite a while ago. I, I asked the question, what percentage of the entire study effort goes towards data collection? And I had different answers. It was multiple choice, and it was like uh, 0 to 20%, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and, and 20% increments. And the overwhelming answer was 40 to 60%, uh, so roughly half. Now, it, it depends on how readily available the data is, how new the system is, because it could be a lot more than that. It could be a lot less than that. Like back in the day when, when I used to perform studies, I used to perform a lot of studies in the past. If I went to a, a really old existing facility, oh my gosh, data collection would just take forever because nobody ever did it before. And you would find yourself getting into equipment and just all kinds of things. And then I had sites that I would go to that were, were new. Uh, and I was there during the commissioning and completing the study. And that was a lot simpler because you could use like contractor takeoffs for conductors. You had uh, shop drawings for, for the equipment and run around and verify everything. So it, it has a lot to do also with just, you know, what how, how new is the system and, and what data is readily available. But there is a, a pretty large amount of data. And the place you want to begin with all this is with the utility company. It's best if you begin with the utility company because that is oftentimes going to be a holdup. You have to get to the right person, and sometimes it may need a little uh, follow-up to try to obtain the data. And the data that you need from the utility company, you need to know what their short circuit current is at the facility where you're performing the study. And it would be good if you could get both the maximum and the minimum short circuit current, but sometimes you're just not going to know because the utility is not going to know. It's good if you could consider maybe what the short circuit current might be in the future, future utility expansion. I want to elaborate on all this uh, a little bit uh, as far as utility data, because this, this is actually the group that I headed up back in my utility days. I, I headed up the short circuit studies group for a transmission system. And so the utility data, it is sometimes difficult to obtain. It's, it's not that utilities are intentionally trying to be a uh, problem about this sometimes they just don't have the staff or, or you know they may not have a, a really big elaborate model for the system so I want to um, give you a couple ideas of, of how to work with this and one of the uh, methods this was actually in the book that I wrote which right now is uh, not in circulate or not not in publication there's a new one it's going to be hopefully I'll start working on it at the end of this year but a workaround for uh, the absence of utility data is to begin with what the industry refers to as an infinite bus. And I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, you can't do that. Uh, that's, that's not a correct statement. You can begin with an infinite bus, but you have to be careful about it. Let me, first, let me explain what an infinite bus is. So an, an infinite bus calculation is where you have an unknown contribution from the source, like from the utility. So what you do is you ignore the impedance from the source, basically assuming it's zero. And you can calculate the short circuit current on the secondary side by taking the transformer's secondary full load current rating times 100 divided by the percent impedance of the transform. It's really simple. And, and so with this, 
give you an example. If we had a 1500 KVA transformer, and the impedance was 5.75%, and let's say the voltage was 480 volts, the short circuit current on the secondary using this equation would be 31,374 amps. 31,374 amps. And you might look at that and think, did you just do that in your head? No, my head's not big enough for that. It's, it's a problem that I've solved a lot with, with different uh, classes and things like that. So 31,374 amps. So um, what you do with this, as far as an arc flash study, if that's all you have to go on, the next step is begin your study with the infinite source, 31,374. And many people say, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Well, I'll explain what that's all about here in a moment. And, and run your study. And what you're doing, going back to what I talked about earlier, is you look at what is the arc rating of the PPE that you're targeting for this. Let's say it's 8 calorie. So you start out with 31,374, build your model, run your study, and identify all the locations where 8 calorie is going to work. That's your base case. Now take the 31,374 and subtract maybe like 10%. Reduce it. And so you drop it a few thousand amps. Rerun the study. It's easy to do that. When you have a database, when you're using software, just go up to the source and, and change it. It's real easy. So change it and then rerun the study and go back and look at where are all the cases where 8 calorie or whatever you select, uh, the arc rating, where's, where's it going to be sufficient? Hopefully, you will see all the same locations as being sufficient. Drop it another 10% and repeat the process. And what will happen is at some point you'll lower the short circuit current to a value where instead of the incident energies coming down as you keep re reducing the, sh the short circuit current, you'll find a value where all of a sudden it spikes, the incident energy goes up. And what happened is you just found the lowest acceptable short circuit current where this PPE will work. And you may think, well, why did it go up? When you reduce the short circuit current enough, there will eventually be a value where the protective devices stop tripping instantaneously and they go into their time delay region. And when that happens, you just found basically a critical short circuit current. You may think, is, is that a good way to go about it? It's not the best way to go about it, but sometimes it's the only option you have if you can't get the information from the utility company. The other thing that I wanted to discuss is some will say, well, Jim, you're not supposed to use the infinite source. Uh, the infinite source isn't the worst case. Well, that, that's an incorrect statement. Infinite source may not be the worst case, but it may be the worst case. And let me explain what happens here. If you use the infinite source, like the 31,374, you have a certain amount of short circuit current. If the clearing time is instantaneous, you have so much current, you have so much time, you get a certain amount of incident energy. Where people get concerned about maybe not wanting to use the infinite source is if you reduce the short circuit current to the actual short circuit current, if the clearing time goes up, Maybe the short circuit current comes just low enough where a device takes a long time to operate. Yeah, that would be a problem. The actual lower short circuit current, a longer duration, that could be worst case. But here's what happens. If you're comparing the infinite short circuit current and maybe the more realistic lower short circuit current, if the clearing times are identical, you don't get a change in the way the device operates, the clearing times are identical, then the infinite source will be. The worst case. So you have to look at it in, in its proper frame of reference. It's, it's not just uh, a statement that the infinite source isn't worst case. It's will the infinite source cause a faster clearing time than the actual short circuit current? And if that causes a, a slower clearing time, then yeah, the lower current might actually be the worst case. I had a question that came in here. Uh, what X over R do I use when I start with an infinite bus? Oh, okay. Um, the question is what X over R do I use when I start with an infinite bus? 
Typically, what I'll do is I use an X over R ratio of, of 12 to begin with. You might think, what's that? The X over R ratio, it's a way to define the angle of the impedance. So you, you could go through all this and determine what the equivalent impedance is. The impedance is just a magnitude. That impedance is made up of both resistive and reactive elements. And so in the power system world, we talk about that in terms of we have so much short circuit current, we have so much impedance based on a specific ratio of X to R. And, and I typically will use 12. And, and where that comes from, this was quite some time ago, there was an IEEE standard. It's called the IEEE Buff Book. And there have been a couple of uh, editions since then. And this was first introduced in uh, one of the IEEE Buff Books. And there was an example in there, and it talked about assume an X over R ratio that gives you a conservative result. Why 12 is conservative is the X over R is also the tangent of the impedance angle. And if you take the inverse tangent of 12, the angle is 85.23 degrees. And no, I don't have trig tables memorized. That's just from another problem. 85.23 degrees, pretty steep. And it's the steep angles that give you more conservative results. So anyway, the answer to the question, 12. I, I think some of the software may use eight. Whether you use eight or 12, you're gonna get pretty close to a you know pretty steep angle in there. So with the source impedance, whether you get the source impedance or just short circuit current, it's you know really good if you can get a maximum and a minimum. <laughs> Sometimes you're just hoping to get anything. I have the comment in there about future utility expansion because over time, utilities uh, can expand. They add new substations, distribution lines, and so forth. And what that means is the short circuit current over time for a given area could actually go up. And that may be a key element in reviewing the arc flash study. NFPA 70E, some of you may remember this, NFPA 70E states that the arc flash study or the incident energy analysis needs to be reviewed when there are major changes or in intervals not to exceed five years. One of the things that can cause a change is if the utility short circuit current changes. And from experience, because this was my group way back, short circuit currents do go up. I, I remember one case where we had a, a, sub, a new substation that went online close to where I used to live in Ohio. And I remember performing the analysis and at the moment, that substation went online, the short circuit current went up like by 30%. So, you know, maybe look a little high. And, and, and so using an infinite source, that's, that's a pretty good way to, to account for, hey, what if this current goes up? Well, if you use an infinite source, it doesn't get any higher than that, except something called motor contribution. It's kind of a separate subject. So, yeah, um, looking at all the different types of scenarios or just playing around with your number like I did. Start out with infinite, drop it 10%, 10%, 10%, and just kind of evaluate what kind of a range of short circuit currents will be suitable to be able to use a certain level of PPE or a certain arc rating of PPE.